So we're going to go ahead and get, uh, get started here. And first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Schneider Electric software overall organization. Uh, as we work with a lot of our customers, and they range from customers with rather small applications to customers with very large enterprise-wide applications, um, we, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at those things that are um, influencing our customers. And we're hearing this word more and more, um, I'm not even so sure it's officially a, a defined term, but digitalization. We keep hearing more and more from our customers about how they're looking to drive their businesses through more and more uh, digital emphasis on the capabilities of improving their, their organizations. And we're taking this look from a broader Schneider Electric software approach. For those of you who may be less familiar with the brands, um, so we have been working as Wonderware has been an independent organization for going on 30 years through a series of different acquisitions. Wonderware is now an organization inside of the broader Schneider, Schneider Electric software organization. And this particular slide that I'm sharing with you here is more referencing the broader entity of Schneider Electric Software, how we're looking across all of those industry challenges that are being represented out there that are kind of common across different verticals and different customer sets, whether it be things like tightened regulations or cybersecurity or aging workforce or those types of things. They're pretty broadly approaching uh, all of those industry verticals we work in. We also work quite closely with our customers in those specific industry verticals to understand what are those business imperatives that, they're dri that are driving their businesses. And you can see some examples of here around operational efficiency and enterprise-wise visibility for decision support and many of the other key aspects of those things that are, you know, that are being constantly coming up in conversations with specific customers. At the same time, we also are looking across the broader technology trends whether they be trends like cloud or industrial internet of the things or mobility and bring your own device or big data analytics or how people are putting those things together and commonly throughout Europe you'll hear things like industry 4.0 and what that means to organizations. So as part of the broader Schneider Electric software organization, we're trying to work holistically um, across our entire portfolio. Clearly one of the anchors of our portfolio is the Wonderware product portfolio set. And inside of the Wonderware product portfolio set, um, the premier offering is System Platform. Uh, and System Platform 2017 first came to market earlier this year. It was in late June of, this, of earlier this year that we first introduced System Platform 2017. And just earlier uh, in, I believe it was in November, we introduced uh, System Platform 2017 Update 1. And throughout the course of this webinar, I'm going to be giving you some insights on aspects of this very significant uh, release, focusing on the area of what we're referring to as operations management interface, or sometimes you'll see that shortened to OMI in this presentation. So I'm going to continue on here. Uh, I did see a note that, uh, that someone was having difficulty hearing. Um, if this is pervasive, someone please let me know, or else I'm just going to assume it was that individual. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed. So when you look at System Platform as an offer, it sets as the kind of the, the core foundation of our industrial software platform. And if you look at this larger rounded rectangle, it's kind of representing all those things that kind of sit inside the software, uh, the System Platform offer, whether it's kind of the core portions of System Platform or through extensibility and modules that you can place on System Platform. Some of them are functional modules like the business process management or intelligence or other aspects. And we also have organizations um, both inside and outside of our, our core organization that deliver industry solutions built on top of those functional modules. For many years, we've been focused on the kind of bringing in that traditional hardware gateway type data, so information from distributed control systems or programmable logic controllers. We've also seen this being used as a platform for uh, bringing commonality across a host of other software packages. So if there were a lot of different human machine interface or supervisory control packages already on site, commonly system platform can be used as a unifying industrial platform across different software and hardware platforms. We're also seeing more and more with the advent of the industrial Internet of Things the, that many of the new devices are going straight up into the software platform and not having a need to go through those traditional hardware gateways. And so we're seeing a big expanse in the type of 
devices that we're covering out there in the marketplace. Um, and much of this, you know, has been hastened in by the adoption of new protocols, things like uh, MQTT, which we added as a core capability about a year ago. And you're going to see around the periphery and the sides of this particular presentation, many of the different types of clients, whether they're going to be clients through browsers, or there's going to be integration into cloud, like we have with Wonderwear Online, access through wearables, or a lot of the traditional software as you see down on the right-hand side, whether it be the human-machine interface applications, like InTouch has been for us for 30 years, or some of the new advents, like operations management interface. For the balance of this presentation, my focus here is going to be around operations management interface. What does that mean? Why is it new? Well, why should you care? Hopefully, in the end, you'll come away um, as excited as we are for what the possibilities that this new technology brings to with, with it. So if we kind of start a little bit at the, at the front of here about, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What are some of the things that we want to do? One of the things we clearly, clearly recognize is that our customers are going to move from Small adoptions typically is either pilots or small in, uh, efforts in uh, a portion of their facility, and then they want to be able to branch out from there. And so much of what we're doing here is all being provided in a, a – provide you ability to start small, validate it, ensure that the things you're trying to achieve are accomplishable, and then ensure 100 percent reusability and as well as longevity um, of those systems. Our focus is to ensure that with every new release that we continue to be able to adopt our new capabilities without any risk to the, um, to the engineering investment that you've already made. We also recognize the responsibility we have as an industrial platform we rec uh, that many of our customers are running in mission-critical operations that are 24 by 7. So we need to do what we can to absolutely ensure that there is the minimum amount of downtime and virtually looking to eliminate any downtime associated with either maintenance of systems or systems upgrades. And that's something that we've been uh, very proud to be able to achieve uh, over the many years. Also working uh, in, the, in the key area of situational awareness, and so you see the points about uh, identifying and resolving abnormal situations before they impact your operation, or improving operator efficiency and reducing the times it takes to complete tasks. This is a journey that we've been on for many years now and something that we've been referring to as situational awareness. And many of the aspects of what we're working toward with operations management interface continue to build upon the successes that we've had in there and extend that uh, much further. As well as continuing to focus on the reduction of engineering. As we look into add more and more capability, we recognize that there's a big a staunch challenge that customers are often reducing their staffs that they have in place and they don't have the ability to go and continue to spend more and more in engineering. The actual focus is they want to extend their applications into broader, greater functional areas and do it with less cost than the previous types of applications have done. That's a significant challenge and one that we, we feel that with operations management interface and the new OMI technology uh, that we've met head on. So when we look at System Platform 2017, um, System Platform has been an offer that's been in the marketplace for over a decade at this point, but System Platform 2017 offers a great advancement in many of the new areas. So when we start talking about the empowering a new age worker with the first operations management interface, this new operations management interface technology, or OMI for short, it becomes our uh, visualization front end into our software platform. For many years, we had utilized the InTouch capabilities as being our visualization front end, and all of that capability remains. We can still utilize InTouch as a front end, and we'll show you here about areas that we've, we've gone beyond that with OMI. We still expect to have our InTouch HMI capability be around for many, many years to come. But with this OMI te technology, we started with the ground up. We didn't take an existing visualization capability and, and try to make that morph to, to work for System Platform. But this was built from the ground up to be the visualization platform for System Platform. And hopefully throughout the course of this webinar, you'll understand a bit about what we're trying to achieve there. As well as the, we wanted to make sure that this was accessible for all different types of users within the organization. Traditionally, our products have been focused on use within the kind of the, the real-time operations and people typically get a title sounded like operator or something of those effects. 
And more and more we're now branching out into not just people in the operations, but more times the people in the management, people in the maintenance staff, and people throughout all different uh, aspects of an organization. And we want to ensure that we're not building products that are tailored solely for use of by engineers and for engineers. And we'll talk a little bit about how we believe we've done some of that transformation. And on this end here, we talk about powering a digital transformation. Um, this is something that hopefully you'll see uh, very much significant when we talk about the plug-and-play context-driven apps. Um, that will be a significant aspect of what I'll be talking about today. And we invited uh, David from uh, J5 International to show things that they have done around this area and how we're opening this community up or open this entire capability up to our whole ecosystem of partners um, and, and uh, system integrator partners and technology partners and distribution partners out there to be part of that overall uh, ecosystem. So as we go forward here, we're going to talk a little bit about when we say context, what are we referring to there? Um, when we talk about things like context at the core, we're really referring to the fact that when we've worked out and talked to a lot of our customers, our customers recognize that there's a lot more than real-time data that they typically need to consume in order to make a decision. Often data may be coming from a variety of systems, and then the graphic on the right-hand side where it shows HMI, or human machine interface, alarming capabilities, trends, maps, documents, or something other. Um, our customers are commonly reporting that there's about between 15 and 20 pieces of software in their operation that they need to utilize. You know, things that may be dealing with asset management or things that may be doing with, you know, quality samples or, or such a variety of different things that they're doing, but that today they're very islanded. And at this core, what we're trying to do with operations management interface is to make that a holistic capability that you can be that can be brought together. So we talk about things like access to external applications. And in the first bullet point, we talk about the embedded browser control. Many of the applications that you're working with now already have web access, but how do I contextually access that? So that when I'm working in, let's say, one part of the facility and I need to go up and bring up that extra piece of software, I don't want to then have to log in again, so I'm going to want to do things like single sign-on. I want to be able to immediately go straight to the point of interest without having to enter that application separately and then navigate or having to even do that from a separate machine. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do here. We talk about leveraging more information, things like SCADA playback. Uh, we recognize that, you know, when traditionally when you're looking at historical data and time series data, the most common way of doing that has been through a trend, and that's been a tried and true mechanism for well beyond the time that even software has been involved. But very commonly, when you're working with a trend, once you're beyond a couple of trend pens, they're really not very valuable to be used. But in a lot of the work that we've done around creating dashboards, they can be used to, be, to analyze historical data so that you can take those real-time dashboards and I'll put them into playback mode so that you can rewind the entire dashboard uh, together, and that provides you a heck of a lot more flexibility and capability for analyzing a larger volume of data uh, as part of a single analysis activity. Now, when you talk about the new custom applications, there are going to be applications that are going to be delivered both from our organization as well as the organizations that we partner with in the overall ecosystem. And some of the examples we have here, we're going to walk through um, as we go throughout this presentation. And one of the more significant ones we have is this, uh, a new mapping application that we've introduced. And we'll certainly be coming back on that with a little bit more detail. When we talk about system platform and, and what it means for our organization, for our customers, it clearly means all those traditional things that, it, that we have already been able to handle as an organization, uh, uh, as a software in infrastructure for over 30 years, being able to connect to data, being able to bring it in, historize it, normalize that data, be able to trigger business uh, logic on that data, be able to alarm that information, all of those things that we've always been able to do and have been at the forefront and been leadership, leadership in the industry in that area continues to be true. But when we look beyond that, beyond the traditional capabilities, we wanted to focus on some other things that we wanted to transform, transformatively go beyond, go beyond, which is accessing information that are outside the typical process control networks consolidating information from multiple data sources that aren't traditional data sources like transmitters, but data sources that could be cloud-hosted data sources, other software packages, uh, and going far beyond the traditional scopes. Truly 
to facilitate our customers to truly understand their business at their fingertips in real time. And that was one of the reasons why we decided to kind of call this a different software category of operations management interface, because traditionally the products of human machine interface have been focused on an operator issuing commands to a piece of hardware. With operations management interface, our focus here was to really empower organizations to do far beyond just operating the machines, but ultimately to be able to operate their businesses in real time. Expose those hidden opportunities, provide enhanced decision-making capability, and ultimately empowering people across the entire ecosystem within that user's uh, organization. We look in here on the right where it starts about people and process and technology. This is a derivative of what's known as the capability and maturity model integration. If that's not something that means anything to you, you could look it up on the internet, it's called CMMI. But it really it's focused on how do I improve a process and it requires you to take a very holistic view on how you improve a process. And that is something that we've done here and why we've broadened our focus with operations management interface. Nearly everything that we've done with the system platform 2017 has been done with a focus towards how do we improve our customers' operational efficiency. So we're going to start working through some practical examples of what we did and what we're trying to achieve here. So when we look here at the responsive design notion, we've often heard for many years customers who wanted to access their applications from a browser, and we're introducing more and more mobility in applications. And we've been able to do this for many, many years within our organization, but typically what that involved was taking the same content that was available on the plant floor systems and just shifting that content to a different location. So if it was a, um, a process graphic, put them, putting that process graphic on the screen involved making that process graphic the same on the, on the phone as it was on the, on the displays that were on the plant floor. But that's not always practical. So the focus that we've been taking on here is more, is more around how do we take content and make our applications more data-driven? to eliminate the need for scripting, to eliminate the need for dragging and dropping, for putting things together, to be able to bring applications together that are automatically generated and that can scale greatly from either small devices into a form factor that works for that small device, or as well, being able to scale it up to very large devices, or we have some customers with control rooms with large numbers of 4K displays. How do we make best use of those without requiring users to go and re-engineer for every target? One of the key paradigms that we've done here is, is the focus for, uh, away from assembling windows and solely content being the window, but really looking at content being abstracted from where the content is hosted. And we'll introduce a, a number of terms, but some of them here we'll bring out to layouts. Layouts are, can be device specific. I can have layouts for my tablets, layouts for my phone, layouts for portrait, layouts for landscape. So that as I'm using my device, my layout knows how to consume the content. The content then becomes accessible within that individual workplace or that application, um, and it presents itself in a way that's very native to that target device. We also recognize that at the same time, we, were, we did not want to start isolating our products down to only the most expert of users. We wanted to figure out mechanisms that allowed our products to be leveraged uh, across a variety of different types of applications. And internally, we use actors to define our use cases, and we've kind of split our actors into those, kind of those content developers and those application designers. Um, whereas content developers may be more focused on things like programming, Whereas the, the application designers are more focused on trying to build together those quick prototypes and those applications that build things out quickly. Um, ultimately, our focus here is allowed that a lot of times we will play the role as developer for our customers, but many times if customers have very customized and specific needs, they can either do that role themselves or hire a system integrator to perform that role for them. But once they have their standards in place, the applications come together very rapidly because all of the things are well understood that comprise that application. An example of how we've worked on this is this visual build, and you're going to see in this animation here how there's a, a, a very much a wizard-driven approach to how applications are created. And so you build your content through these wizards, which automatically also builds your graphics, and it builds the asset model inside of you, inside of this application. We looked towards what succeeded for 30 years with inside of InTouch, and within touch, 
building the graphical applications and having the tag name dictionary just become part of the result has been a very successful model. And for those applications that have custom content like piping instrumentation style diagrams and process visualization, this is the same types of models that we'll be able to approach with use of System Platform 2017. We also recognize that with this new version of content where we're talking about less about, hey, I'm going to put a, a circle down here or a rectangle and animate it, but now I'm talking about a greater level of capability where I need an application that plugs in here that does analytics or I need something that does much, much greater capability. We've built an entire infrastructure for the hosting and the um, contextual access of these applications that we're just calling apps that are focused on not just the traditional operational technology, or OT, but also can consume information of information technology, or IT. So sometimes you'll hear us refer to this as an IT and OT convergence platform, which is a pretty long, buzzwordy sounding phrase, but it really is probably one of the simplest ways of describing what we're attempting to achieve here. A single interface that can be used across a variety of groups within an organization to access at their fingertips in real time whatever information is needed to be able to make a critical decision for your business and your process. Much of what we wanted to do was to be able to, as I mentioned, perform the role of the developer for a lot of our customers. So we have developed a lot of capabilities that come right out of the box, and if you can utilize those capabilities, if you don't need to customize, there's around 80% of the base application is available for you out of the box. The applications like the object models, and what we refer to as object wizards, that come along with it, the pre-built-in symbols and face plates. We also have symbol wizards that allow you to have all those different types of representations, graphic capabilities, styles, so the choice of color and what is a good choice of color and a bad choice of color, all of those things are already delivered, as well as what we refer to as application frameworks, which have pre-built screen profiles and layouts and, and dashboards, and all of this content is there and ready. And even if you decide that you need to customize content, this is a great start for you and can also be leveraged as a good indicator of best practice as you develop your own content if you want to build custom content for yourselves. At the core, we, introduce, we, ha we utilize the same process visualization as a visualization content across multiple uh, mechanisms of delivery. So our standard graphic editor for our graphics, which are referred to as our Kester graphics, are going to be common across things like the InTouch HMI, as well as the new Operations Management Interface, or OMI technology. As we build out maps and apps, or excuse me, not just maps, but apps, such as the mapping app, that are able to leverage that process graphics, we're going to take it from the same core definition. And as we expand into things like uh, web-based visualization, native web-based visualization, which was also added in the recent InTouch uh, 2017 Update 1, they're all coming from the same core graphic standard. So our customers are able to define one common standard that they're able to leverage across all those points of access, and we're also focusing on bringing the same capability down to our machine edition level. So it's a very strategic technology for us here. So here's an example that I'm going to show you of one of the apps, um, and this is a mapping application that we introduced. And what you're seeing here on the, on the side here is that there's a, uh, you can see a map of North America, and there's a bunch of uh, little callouts that are referring to states. Those callouts are showing live information on them in this example. And you're seeing it's also being, being contextualized with our Insight application, which is doing the trending. You can actually even see on that West Virginia trend, there's a highlight on the uh, on the trend that's showing the alarm. There's a little process graphic faceplate that's down there for West Virginia, and you can see at the bottom that there's a, uh, an alarm page. This is all just assembled through drag and drop. You see, I need a map here, I need a uh, Insight app over here, I need the faceplate to show here, I need the alarms here, I have my title bars at the top, and these things can be very quickly brought together. This is simply just an example of some of the core apps that we're delivering now, but the key thing here is that the content that's on the map that comes from the standards, comes from your objects. These pins that are being shown that represent the states in this example, those pins are actually defined as our caster graphics. You want to customize those graphics, you seem to get you use the same graphic editor that you use to process any of your process graphics. And so it's a simple, you learn once and reuse it throughout any aspect of your uh, development of this type of an application. 
Another example of a tool that we've recently released is one that was called the Presenter App. This was included with Update 1. The one thing that this actually does is is very unique is it allows you to take any one of these uh, graphics that's coming from your model and allows you to just say, I'm going to take that graphic and repeat it in, I say, a grid or a tile. And so you're seeing in some of the graphic on the left-hand side uh, here, and I'll try to use my mouse pointer to bring it up here. So this particular element here is automatically just going throughout the things within this storage unit, and it's bringing out information that it knows, goes into the data model, and just puts it in a list. Here was an application that was kind of probably more designed for a phone, where I'm able to then take a list of the alarm states of anything in that area and just go ahead and tile them out. Here is an example where they've actually showed multiple graphics that are uh, as part of the system, and so this is a larger process graphics which are actually being put together in a grid all together. One thing that's fantastic about this is it allows you a very responsive user interface so that as you reshape it, it'll resize it. You don't have to worry about what's the resolution of this application. Everything can become automatically and dynamically defined on the fly as part of this. We're also going to be deliver, have delivered as part of this many of the core aspects of navigation. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because I think Rob Bobby would rather me to defer the time for him to show it. But you'll see things like um, breadcrumb views or tree views. These all come off of a standard navigation model that you define the model and utilize this to have it generate the graphic application for you. I think with that, I'm going to take a breath and and I'm going to hand the presenter role over to Rob Kambach, and Rob will then take you through some of the demo collateral that he's got here for you. So let me meet Rob, the presenter. So Rob, I've just passed presenter credential to you. You should be able to go ahead and share. Okay, okay. Um, good morning, um, everybody. Afternoon, depending where you are. Um, so I'm Rob Kamek, Product Manager for um, InSearch, um, or, or the Operation Management Interface and uh, System Platform. I'm going to show you a brief demo. Sorry, my voice is not all there. That's why John took over for me for the first part, um, because I came back on a plane from Europe this week and caught something. Um, so the first part where I wanted to start is show you uh, some of the uh, uh, multi-touch functionality that's built in. Um, so I'm going to... Um, take this and I'm going to show you some of the examples here that are on the screen. Uh, typically we have um, two different different operations. So the first one is uh, one, one finger element operations, which you can see here, um, and then two finger pane operations, of course, and then uh, three finger or more. Um, so, the, so the one finger operation is really to interact with uh, elements uh, on the screen um, and do things like uh, set a value, um, like here, or reset a value, and this, then, this is then a two-finger operation in this case because it's, it has a safety, it's more like a safety uh, feature. Uh, and, in, and then here you can do the same um, using your um, two-finger uh, touches. Uh, the other part is we have some labels here that I can switch on and off. And then there are different uh, keyboards um, um, on the system that are resizable that you can use. Um, if you don't like the keyboards that we did, so these are the ones that we did, um, you can also direct use the uh, OS keyboards on the system, so you can bring that up. And uh, by pressing on the title bar, you can bring up the OS keyboard. Um, that will bring that up, and you can use the regular Windows um, Windows 10 um, uh, keyboard. Uh, we have <clears throat> within this uh, double double click, like if you're zoomed in, so pan and zoom is a two finger operation, and then uh, to pan around, you just use your finger like this, and then double click. We'll take it back to a regular view. Um, the three finger operations are interesting. They bring in um, menus, so they can bring in things like a. Um, the, this is my navigation model, and I didn't have to build this. So, so if you build a plan model in System Platform, that automatically propagates to to the viewer. There's nothing to set up. So automatically, you can attach graphics to assets. We call them assets. Those are objects. Um, these objects are automation objects. Automation objects can be things like devices, units, or areas. Um, so within these areas, you can then link your graphics to this model that you created. And uh, once it's uh, when you have once you have the graphics linked, then there is no work to be done within uh, the InSearch OMI application. Everything is automatically linked, and the system knows what your selected asset is. Um, one of the things that uh, John alluded to is the uh, historical playback. 
So if you um, if I go to uh, uh, essay demos, then these are our, our essay graphics and uh, these are dashboard graphics. So some of these dashboard graphics, for example, if you would want to replay data from yesterday, um, you can bring up a menu. Let me go back here and bring this up and switch on SCADA playback. Um, when I switch on SCADA playback, the system is going to go into a playback mode and disconnect from real-time data. So at this point, without any scripting or me doing anything, the only prerequisite is that anything you want to play back is historized in our historian. Um, you actually choose a choose a uh, any any time, and you play back. So now it's playing data back from a, a time that is just being displayed here, was, which was 11.34, like half an hour ago. I can also speed it up um, to see, <coughs> sorry, and there are no limits in how fast we can play uh, things back. So, uh, I mean, in this case, it's 20 times. The, the thing that controls this is uh, basically um, an orchestra graphic. So it's not a control. These are just variables that you can put on any graphic and you can control the historical playback. So this is a powerful feature. Um, if you have a multi-monitor installation and you're using um, two or three or four or five monitors, uh, it will play back the data on all four or five monitors at that point. Um, the title bar indicates um, in yellow that this is being um, uh, played back at this point. It's just warning you that you're not in real-time mode uh, because if I go to one-time playback, it could be confused for real-time operations. So you switch it off, and then at that point you're back in a regular runtime operation. So that's historical playback, and one of the powerful features of uh, Intel's OMI. Um, then we go to uh, uh, storage, and I wanted to show you uh, some of the apps. So, so if you look at the apps that we have, there is a. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the inside app, but the the idea is that um, in a normal system, in, in other systems, you would have to configure trends. You have to configure this. You have to configure that to make something work. You have to use scripting. Um, here, the system knows from this tank that it has a level pressure and temperature that, that's trended. It knows from every asset. So this storage tank of one is an asset, and that asset has a bunch of devices and a bunch of signals that are coming in. Um, by bringing up the uh, trend application, it automatically knows that on this tank, I have a level, a pressure, and a temperature, and it will grab that data from the historian and show it to us in a app, um, which is the historical trend app. Um, now, the neat thing about that is that you also have, and let me go here, make this a little bit bigger so you can show it, uh, so I can show it. So, so this is a, 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 a application that also shows you when certain things went into alarm, um, and this is an HTML5 chart. Um, so I can actually go and click here and see what the event was um, that somebody acknowledged the alarm. So I can actually see when things went into alarm because it puts a um, color onto the line. Um, and then they're a little bit small here because the time period was very small. But you can see here, here it went into alarm and here the operator acknowledges. So you, so you can see the process data and the alarm and event data being unified in one view. Um, and showing you the relevant uh, information specifically for that particular storage tank. Um, the other application that is in context and, and basically brings up information in context with that asset could be a map. Um, so the mapping application John already alluded to um, actually shows me where this asset is on the map, and it will show me the location and bring up these maps. We support all kinds of overlays. So you can use Bing Maps, Google Maps, um, Azure uh, application. You can use layers, um, switch layers on and off. You can pull in weather information from other, other sources, from Internet sources, from WMS. Um, so there's a lot of options in the mapping application to make things visible. Um, and it's directly integrated with um, the OMI application in your asset model. So that's the mapping application. And we talked a little bit about the um, um, presenter app. So the presenter app. When, when you design normally um, a, a screen like this in, in that I'm showing here, um, this was manually crafted. So when I make this a different form factor and I go to a smaller form factor, for example, I can use this, but it becomes smaller and smaller. And I could, yes, I can still see things by using things like pan and zoom, um, 
but it actually would be nice if the system would automatically reformat itself to the form factor that would be available to the uh, view application. And this particular view app, for example, scales all the way from 1020, 1280p to 1280 to 4K, and there's no problem to handle that. Um, when you go smaller, however, to a tablet or a phone, or even smaller, the phone is really, really a, a small form factor. You would want to have, in this case, you see five columns here and then three rows. Um, so if I click on tank status, it will grab one of these graphics and it will basically say, look at the model, how many tanks that are there, and repeat that graphic in a in a plotting environment. So I don't have to create that graphic. Those graphics are programmatically created. So when I click on that, it basically finds these 24 tanks and plots them for me on the screen. If the real estate gets smaller, then basically it's going to reformat it and show me four columns. If I would be on a phone um, or a tablet or even uh, on a phone, I would just have one column. So, so the application automatically adjusted itself to, um, um, to the form factor. The other thing that this application does, it actually shows you things only from where it is. So if I, and what I mean with that is, let's say I go to storage and I go to building one. I know on the building one, I have seven graphics of seven storage tanks. If I click on the overview button here uh, for the presenter application, I get all those seven graphics. So it's also contextual with my assets. If I go up to storage here and I click on the presenter application, then now it shows me everything that's under this particular um, um, uh, area, so which are 24 graphics. And another thing that we also did, these are, uh, so these are the applications. The other thing that we did also in this particular update, um, uh, it was um, a lot of things around alarming for 2017. So if I switch on an alarm, we have what we call the feature called the alarm aggregation. So I want us to be able to see without having an alarm banner, which is kind of old, um, and be able to see it for the operator where an active alarm is present in the system and how important it is, what kind of severity it has. So I can, I can generate an alarm here. And then basically I can see on the model that this is generated from storage tank uh, 11 uh, in this case. So, so I can see very quickly where a alarm is coming from. And then if I want to have more specifics around the alarm, I can bring up the traditional, more traditional alarm grid, and, um, what people are used to. But the alarm aggregation helps you, <coughs> helps you getting awareness basically on any level that you are in a system, you can see what's going on and how many alar alarms that are outstanding and what are the most important ones. Uh, we also allow you in runtime to switch things off. Then the last thing that I'm going to show you before I'm going to hand it back to um, uh, uh, John and David Dollar is clutter and declutter. So one thing is that you would want to have, um, and let me just um, up here and switch off some of these uh, variables. So all these uh, assets that we are providing out of the box to situational awareness graphics, including face plates in this case, so when you click on something, you get a face plate. Uh, you can also uh, turn things on and off here. Uh, so if I turn all this off, all the information is very blend on the on the on the screen. This is like a level two screen. If I then zoom in, I get more details. So before, like the tag names are not visible and all the information. If I go further out, when I get go closer, I'm basically shows me more details. So that's clutter and declutter. Um, and the other one that I wanted to show before I uh, give it over are the assets that we deliver out of the box which is a um, uh, control library for process automation. And it gives you all the valves, all the, all the, um, all of, all the uh, uh, PNID um, uh, controllers. And when you click on them, you, you basically get a <coughs> faceplate that allows you to operate that device. If that's a PNID instrument or a uh, valve, um, and all those are coming out of the box for you to be ready to use. So, Around the device level, we give you a lot of examples of how to implement these and how, how these faceplates are created with them. Um, and that's all in the demo files that you can download. Um, so that's, that's basically um, uh, in touch um, uh, or system platform with uh, operation management interface. I'm going to hand it back now to um, the other presenters. Thank you. So, Rob, please go ahead and make Dave Dollar the presenter here, and then Dave will share his screen. Yes. So, 
thank you very much for a great, uh, great presentation and demo, Rob, and I thank you also for doing it under some duress with your voice there, so I appreciate that. So we've invited David. David comes from J5 International because one of the key things that we've been working on and we have released recently was a, uh, was a software developer kit, or SDK, that allows third parties to get access to this contextualization infrastructure that we've been demonstrating and discussing so that they can build it directly into apps for themselves. And so with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll, let you, I'll just say that we are going to be, we have released that SDK. We're in the process of making a marketplace available that should be available uh, early in first quarter next year for the delivery of these types of apps. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to David. David, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I want to say that uh, I was assisted in this demo by Stephen Hoffmeyer. He's one of our senior developers from our Cape Town, South Africa office. And although Stephen was not able to join us today in this presentation, he did want me to pass along to the audience that working with the uh, Operations Management Interface SDK, the API, and the examples provided was intuitive and very helpful, and especially for someone who really has never worked with Wonderware applications and toolkits. So good job there. Now, a little background on J5 International, we are a global company with regional offices and we've been supplying industrial operations management software for over 20 years uh, across a wide range of industries. And we are a longtime partner of Wonderware and Schneider Electric, really filling a need for the typically manual, often paper-based operational business processes related to communication either across shifts uh, or across different departments within the facility. And a question that I would like uh, you to ask yourself, in your role, which half of operations do you manage? The process or the people? And in today's increasingly complex business and manufacturing environments, can you really ever say it is one or the other? Uh, isn't it time for you to be able to effectively manage both? And here we are in close alignment with Schneider Electric and the concept of the operations management interface. Uh, which brings us to the demonstration I'm about to present, which will show you how J5 has used the operations management interface SDK to deliver to the operator context-driven and actionable information associated with their area of responsibility. The J5 operations management system facilitates the manual recording of events or the response to events automatically created through integration with Wonderware or other systems. Some events or subset, subsets of the event, uh, such as this example of managing steps within a work permit, are delivered to the J5 mobile application. This helps really facilitate a collaborative communication process with the console operator. Uh, configuration of the J5 IndustriForm user experience that I'm about to show you inside the Wonderware system platform um, is accomplished using a spreadsheet-like environment, the IndustriForm Designer. And within this configuration tool is the fine-grained control of form design, integration, connections, uh, approvals, conditional visibility, and the output of this configuration is displayed in the browser or the mobile. Uh, we feel that uh, the J5 operations management system really provides for spreadsheet configurability and enterprise capabilities. So let me go over to the demo. And you should recognize this. Uh, similar to what Rob had presented, just in a slightly different color. And what I'm going to do here is drill into the Paris level. Now, this, um, this demonstration is uh, centered around the shift handover and a multi-level shift handover because it's quite common in our customers' environments to have shift-to-shift -shift communications at different, different levels of the process in the organization. And the shift handover is key but not generally done well. And so we believe that the integration of these two technologies really help um, uh, accelerate uh, uh, 
best practices within your organization. So here I'm at the, at the Paris level, and it's very common to come in and set uh, who's going to be uh, operating at what position within this area of the plant. And this particular shift handover has several sections where we're, we're bringing over information, possibly from the last time this shift uh, was uh, the last shift handover, carrying it forward. Maybe presenting information, uh, uh, documents attached, uh, pictures, etc. general information about the shift. Uh, it's quite common to be looking or considering information from external sources, outside of J5, of course, this information coming from the system platform, maybe presenting this in, con in context where comments can be uh, additionally added. And added here because at the end of the shift, this, this is going to be an email with this form delivered to the recipients for a snapshot picture of what's been going on for the shift. This particular shift handover also has some key events that were pulled through from lower areas of this uh, section, in this case the storage area, uh, uh, allowing me to easily access those. I'll show you those in a, in a moment. Logbook entries being carried up from uh, uh, different areas of the uh, facility. In this one, there's a, an environmental logbook entry that might be of interest to me that I need to come in here and take a look at. And here's the information that was that was entered. And maybe all I need to do is add some notes. Uh, this is the, the context of my understanding, my information. This isn't lost somewhere. But it's now part of this record and available as part of the shift handover. Some shift handover, some business processes also want to implement uh, more defined approval processes. In this particular example, I can't do the approvals because I haven't actually uh, submitted all of the sections. I'm not going to do that to all right now, but when I have submitted all these sections, I then can do the approvals. Let me go a little bit farther down. Different parts of the organization might have similar views of the shift handover, but oftentimes it's with different levels, different levels of detail and information, different persons on this uh, area of the shift handover. Again, carrying forward information from the previous shift is an important aspect. Uh, here, maybe recording additional crew information because uh, we need to know as much as possible uh, who was involved at the shift because when we take a look at this shift handover three months from now and try to determine what was going on, we may very well use the playback feature that Rob showed you, along with looking at the shift handover to really get to uh, uh, to find out what happened during that shift. Again, with operations logbook and work instructions here, and additional context information that could be coming from Wonderware, could be coming from databases. It's other information in the system, and if it uh, uh, needs to come into the shift handover, we can bring it forward. Let me go one level deeper. And this is down at the building one level of this, uh, this demonstration. And here we're actually grabbing some values from system platform for these, uh, these tank values. We're looking at these operations log entries. But here we also have two other things. It's quite common to, um, to have operational tasks. Where do I where do I do my operational tasks? This is not maintenance, so it's not going to be an SAP or Maximo, but this is the operational tasks that just need to be um, taken care of by this group of, uh, of operators. Uh, here is a tank cleaning operation for, um, this will be for storage tank 004, maybe with access to the tank cleaning procedures for this particular item. With maybe high-level steps presented to the user here that can be signed off on. And additional more uh, information can also be implemented here as well. Additionally, whenever there's any type of work like this in any industrial setting, there's uh, 
often a permitting process. So here's a permit uh, for vessel entry for this. And here's where the, um, the, the planners have uh, implemented a very detailed permit process that also includes a, an operator user experience out on the mobile device. So here's the mobile device. Um, on my screen, I've got uh, the, the console operator with his uh, HMI and, um, and the, uh, the permit. And the operator out in the field actually going through those permits, going through his checks, and in near real time, if there's wireless, actually updating the checklist here for the benefit of the console operator. So a true collaborative work environment uh, without uh, relying on radios and, um, and missing information on pieces of paper. And just coming back up to the Paris level here, at the conclusion of this uh, shift handover, this report will be generated and emailed out and become a snapshot in time record uh, that is uh, part of the documentation of business processes at this facility. And with that, I will turn this back over to team. Thanks, David. I think you did a fantastic job of showing how you were able to bind together the capabilities of the J5 International software and contextually access that in, uh, with uh, aspects to what the system platform has. So with that, I hope the attendees all um, were able to have a good look at what we were doing with operations management interface, how, how we believe we have truly introduced kind of the, the next paradigm and what is going to be industrial operations management.